And good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Word of Faith Fellowship Radio Program. I'm Gerald Sutherland, Associate Pastor of the Word of Faith, and this is my wife, Linda. Good morning. We've been with you before, and it's a joy to be with you again today to share with you what God's been showing to us from His Word. And uh, several weeks ago, I was on the program and was sharing with you some things that God had been teaching me out of the Gospel of Matthew chapter 16, when Jesus told his disciples, and he then was at the same time telling us that he would give us the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And at that time, one of the keys that God had revealed to me was the key of humility, of walking in humility before God and receiving the direction from the Spirit of God. And so I I, I realized at that time even that there were many other keys that God wanted to show us. And sure enough, since then, God's begun to show us and show my wife another one of those keys that we must have in order to know how to live godly and holy in Christ Jesus and to fulfill the plan and purpose of God for his church. So today we're going to be sharing another one of those keys. And I feel like in the future, from day to day, week to week, month to month, God's going to begin to reveal more and more of those keys, those principles of living and operating in the kingdom of heaven. And that's the way God wants us to live. So Linda, go ahead and share with them what God has shown you today. Well, I'm, I'm going to start out with Colossians, the second chapter. And, you know, it's a very, um, it's a very serious day and time in which we're living. And, uh, and yet we could have great hope because my hope is that I will make it to heaven either when Jesus comes back again for the church or if I die before then. But that's what our goal is, is to make it to heaven. But in the meantime, to walk with him day by day, minute by minute. And so we've got to be very grounded because this day and this hour, uh, I mean, there are so many doctrines, so many thoughts about various things that we consider to be Uh, foundations in our hearts and lives that now unless you're rooted and grounded and what you know the Bible says in your relationship with Jesus then you could be turned upside down so to speak I was thinking this morning I had a friend uh, growing up went through elementary school with her uh, high school and even uh, a year of college we went to the same college at at the same time and she um I, I would walk to school with her, uh, went to her home many times. She was a church-going uh, young lady. Uh, she had many foundations that we would consider just to be all the foundations that if you'd gone to church and were in Sunday school all your life, that you would have grounded in your heart. And she went to this school, and I did too, and she happened to take a religion class. I didn't have to take it, and I'm grateful I did not. But she took a religion class. And after one semester of being in that class, she some of the foundational principles, for instance, the virgin birth, she no longer believed in. I mean, I was so shocked, so astonished to hear her talk and how that thing had changed and how men's ideas and what men thought about the Word of God came into play and could completely upset everything in her that she had been taught all of her life. So I want to read here in Colossians, the second chapter, beginning with verse 6. As you have therefore received Christ, even Jesus the Lord, so walk, regulate your lives, and conduct yourselves in union with and conformity to Him. That makes it real clear. Our lives are to be regulated. They're to conform to His will, to what He has laid out for us all of our lives. Those of us have been in church, been in Sunday school, all of those principles. And then He says, Have your roots of your being firmly and deeply planted in Him, fixed and founded in Him. Not men's ideas, but founded in Him. Being continually built up in Him, becoming increasingly more confirmed and established in the faith, just as you were taught and abounding and overflowing in it with thanksgiving. And we should be so grateful for those foundations that have been put into our heart over the years. And then verse 8, a very significant verse. See to it that no one carries you off as spoil 
or make sure yourselves captive by their so-called philosophy, and that's what my friend experienced. Men's so-called philosophy, intellectualism, vain deceit, plain nonsense. Following human tradition, men's ideas of the material world rather than the spiritual world, just crude notions, following elementary teachings of the universe, disregarding the teachings of Christ the Messiah. And today we've got to guard against disregarding the teachings of Christ the Messiah and letting any of those little seeds of doubt and unbelief creep into our hearts because it will have a harvest eventually in your heart. Whatever you put in, that's what's going to bring the harvest. And so it's very important that we do not get carried off and have a lot of things grow up in our hearts. And then either you come to the knowledge of, well, this is wrong, and you have it rooted out, or maybe you never get it out. You know, I was just thinking over the years that you and I have been in the ministry, we've met a lot of people who seem like at the moment that we knew them, they were on fire for God. I mean, they really had a zeal for God. But then over a period of time, you begin to see them drift away from those foundations that you were talking about. And now, I mean, some of them we've never seen before, rather since then. <clears throat> but their, their lives are a shambles because the foundation crumbled when the attacks came. And they do come. They will come. And uh, the purpose of those attacks, of course, is to, to cause your foundations to crumble so that you don't stand for God. The Bible says those that endure to the end shall be saved. That's right. That's right. And so I, I was, I've was. i been reading in, in Matthew, and I'm reading in the fifth chapter of Matthew there where it's the Sermon on the Mount. And many of you that have been in church all your life and in Sunday school, you'll recognize that. And so it, Jesus goes on talking to his disciples and the people that are gathered around him. And then he gets down to a verse, verse 20, and this is what it says. For I tell you, unless your righteousness, your uprightness, and your right standing with God is more than that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. That's right. Never enter the kingdom of heaven. So if it's, if it's got to be more than what theirs is, we need to find out what theirs is so we can make sure ours is more than that. He says, you have heard that it was said to the men of old, you shall not kill, and whoever kills shall be liable and unable to escape the punishment imposed by the court. And of course, we know the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill, and we wouldn't want to do that. We never even come into our thinking that we'd even be a part of anything like that. But then Jesus said, but I say to you, everyone who continues to be angry with his brother or harbors malice against him will be liable and unable to escape the punishment imposed by the court. I mean, he goes a step further than what the Pharisees and what the letter of the law is. Not just not to kill, but you don't get, you know, remain angry over something they said or something they did. See, that takes it a little bit further, and it involves the heart. That's just not what happens on the outward of pulling a trigger to kill somebody, but what's in your heart? Are you still harboring something in your heart against them? And then he says, um, whoever speaks contemptuously, insultingly to his brother will be li liable and unable to escape the punishment imposed by the Samhe Sanhedrin. And whoever says, you cursed fool, you empty-headed idiot, we might say, you're crazy. Yeah. Something like that. You're liable and unable to escape the hell fire. And so that makes it more serious. And of course, with Jesus and with our Father God, everything is a heart issue. It's not what is happening all the time on the outside because it, what's happening on the outside is just reflection of what's going on on the inside. And so then I went on over to uh, later in the book of Matthew, reading on through in chapter 15. And, and let me tell you, first of all, what is a Pharisee? What is a scribe? A Pharisee was a member of a Jewish sect distinguished by observance of the traditional and written law, and they kind of felt like they were superior to everybody else. They were very self-righteous. 
very hypocritical. In other words, you do what I say, but you don't do how I do. In other words, they live two separate lives. They taught one thing, but then they acted another way. And you know, one of our young ministers recently got up and preached, and he told how God was dealing with him about what he gets up and shares and preaches to others. Is he actually living that, and is he actually practicing that when he gets home and leaves that church building? And that's so very, very true for every one of us. You know, I was talking to a man yesterday evening, and he told me, that uh, that he knew a person or had met a person recently uh, that was no longer going to church. They grew up in the church. But somewhere along the line, uh, they were wounded. They were hurt over something that happened. He didn't know what. But because of that, that person was no longer going to church. And it's been years since that incident happened. And unfortunately, that happens all too often where people are wounded, they're disillusioned, uh, they trust someone that they think should be walking upright and holy, and then they fall into sin, and then their lives, because they're observe, observing that person, their lives are in a shambles. That's right. And that's where it's so important. We must have our individual relationship with Jesus so that absolutely nothing shakes us just like Abraham. It talks about over there in Romans, the fourth chapter, that Abra- Abraham was just steady steady, that he was not moved by anything, and if anyone ever had an opportunity to be moved by circumstances, he surely did, but because he was not moved, he had that foundation which was just turning to Jesus, just believing in God, just believing what he said, what he said he meant, and what he meant he would do. So, uh, another scripture over in Matthew, it says, have you heard that it was said You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Well, I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now, that's a whole different thing. Love those who hate you. It's very easy to love those who love you. But those that hate you or have ought against you, and that goes that beyond what the pharisaical system is. You know, just just do on the outside. Again, that has to be a heart, a heart change before right. you can do that. That's exactly right. And God commanded, honor your father, honor your mother. He who curses, reviles, or speaks evil, or abuses, or treats improperly his father and mother, let him surely come to this end by death. Now, we all know that's another commandment. Honor your father and mother that your days may be long upon the earth. We probably, most of us, have been taught that, heard that, since we were very little. But I say, if anyone tells his father or mother what you have gained from me, that is, the money, whatever I have that might be used to help you, is already dedicated as a gift to God, then he's exempt, no longer under obligation to honor or to help his mother and father. Well, that is ridiculous, but that's a man-made rule. Certainly, we're to honor our parents, and whatever we have, we want to use to be able to help them. And yes, we want to give our tithes, our offerings to God, but see how they made up a rule to suit their circumstances and to what would suit them at the time and give them a a way out. We're not looking for ways out. We're looking for ways to to fulfill the will of God, to fulfill what he has said here. And so God says, you pretenders, you hypocrites, admirably and truly did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, these people draw near me with their mouths, honor me with their lips, and with their hearts hold off and are far from me. Uselessly do they worship me, for they teach as doctrines the commands of men. He said, it's useless to say, I worship you. It's useless for you to go around and say, oh, I'm so thankful. Oh, I just praise God for what he's done for me. When it's only a lip service, it's only an outward show because you're doing what the people are expecting you to say, what they're expecting you to do instead of truly in your heart. You're so grateful. You're so thankful for all the things that God has done for you. And so over there in Isaiah, Jesus was quoting what happened at uh, Over there in Isaiah, the 29th chapter, the 13th verse. For as much as men draw near me with their mouth, honor me with their lips, but remove their hearts and minds far from me, 
and their fear of me is only a reverence that is a commandment of men that's been learned by repetition without any thought about its meaning. No heart in it. Just doing it over and over again. How many things have we done? How many things have our families passed on down to us time and time again? Oh, that's my family's done that for years. Or we did that last year. Or this is just something my family likes to do. Is it based in Jesus? Did Jesus initiate that? Is that something that is in the Word of God? No, many times it's not. And we we think we get to thinking when we don't even question. Well, did Jesus lead, is he leading that to do us again now? He may have in the past, but is that what he's saying that we're supposed to do now? See, this is where the Pharisees would just they wanted Jesus to direct his disciples to do everything according to just the law instead of what is Jesus saying to do? Having Jesus in our heart, being born again, turning and looking to him in everything that we do and everything that we say. Um, it says over there in Mark, the seventh chapter, um, he's talking about, again, about just doing what you're told to do and not you know, having any heart in it. He said to them, he said to the Pharisees, he said to those around him, you have a fine way of rejecting, thus thwarting, nullifying, doing away with the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition, your human regulations. What links would we go to to keep what man has passed down and what man is saying instead of what God is saying? Thus you're nullifying, making void, and of no effect the authority of the Word of God through your tradition, which in turn you turn around and hand on, and you hand it down to your children and to your grandchildren, and there may be no Jesus in it whatsoever. No Jesus in it whatsoever. And many of these kind of things, he says, you are doing. A very significant verse also is in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, we've prophesied in your name. We've driven out demons in your name. We've done many mighty works in your name. I, I've, I was there every time the church doors were open. I, I taught Sunday school for years, Jesus. Don't you remember? I used to do that. I used to say that. Yes. Because I thought I was doing everything. I was, you might say, crossing every T and dotting every I according to what I had been taught rather than doing what God told me to do. That's right. And that doesn't work with God. It doesn't work with God. And so he said, and then I will say to you openly and publicly in front of everyone, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who act wickedly, disregarding my commands, what he says. And, and of course, what everything that Jesus says, see, when he came, that was the end of the law because Jesus is everything of the law. Certainly, he would not have you to kill anyone. Certainly, he would have you to honor your father and your mother. And he goes beyond and explains to you and shows you ways that you can do those things, going beyond that pharisaical system, going beyond the scribes, going beyond because it requires the heart to go beyond. It becomes a relationship with Jesus it requires a heart change to go beyond that. And he said, unless we do, we will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So I don't want him saying to me on that day, depart from me. I never knew no. you. That's the worst thing that could ever happen to an individual. That's right. That's right. The worst thing that could ever happen to you would be to stand before God and God would say to you, depart from me. I didn't know you. I had no relationship with you. That's right. And so... He goes on and he goes into a, a tax collector's house because he was invited to and, and the Pharisees noticed and was astonished to see that as Jesus sat down to dinner, uh, he didn't wash his hands. And it wasn't just washing your hands. 
before you sit down to eat. It was a ceremonial washing where they would clench their fists and their wash up to their elbows and all of these ritualistic things that really, as it spoke about over there in Colossians, was just a nonsensical thing. It didn't really matter amount to anything. But he said, listen, it's not what's on the outside. It's what's on the inside. He said, you yourselves are full of greed, robbery, extortion, malice, and wickedness. And he said, woe to you, because he said, you load men with oppressive burdens, hard to bear, and you do not personally even lift your fingers to touch the burdens with one of your hands, telling people what they're supposed to do and yet not doing it themselves. And a real good example of this, and then we're going to move on to uh, over to the book of Romans. But there were two men who went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood to stand ostentatiously and began to pray and say, God, I thank you. I'm not like the rest of men, extortioners, swindlers, unrighteous in heart, adulterers, or even like this tax collector over here. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I gain. But the tax collector merely said, standing off at a distance, wouldn't even lift up his eyes to heaven, didn't think he was worthy to, kept striking his chest and saying, Oh God, be favorable, gracious, merciful to me, an especially wicked sinner that I am. I tell you, this man was the wind, one that went to his home justified, forgiven, made upright, and right standing with God rather than the other man. He who exalts himself will be abased. He who humble himself will be exalted. So over, let's go on over to the book of, of Romans now. And again, it's talking about in chapter 4 about Abraham and how it was accredited to him. It was given to him and accredited to his account, put to his account that he was righteous, been in right standing with God because he believed what God said and he refused to change from what God had said to him. And in addition to that, he did what God said. That's right. He obeyed. And it wasn't just a matter of being willing to do it. It was a matter of obeying and doing what God told him to do. That's right. Now, it went that step further, going and finding out what God said. And you know, he had so much opposition against him, but it was a real miracle. But then on down in the first verse of Romans, the fifth chapter, it says, Therefore, since we are justified, and we are, if we're born again, walking with Jesus, having that relationship with him, acquitted, declared righteous, given a right standing with God through our faith, through our believing in him, not through a set of works that we have done, but through faith and believing in Jesus and given right standing with him. Let us grasp the fact that we have peace with him now, the peace of reconciliation to hold to and enjoy peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And oh, there's no amount of money that can pay enough to buy that peace that is right with him. And then in the 10th chapter, it starts, he's talking about the Jewish people, about the scribes, the Pharisees, the Jews. I bear them witness that they have a certain zeal. They have a certain enthusiasm for God, but it's not enlightened according to correct and vital knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness that God inscribes and makes it acceptable to him in, in word, thought, and deed, and seeking to establish a righteousness of their own. They sought to establish their own righteousness, a set of rules and regulation. Instead of just turning to Jesus, he was there. He was there all the time, and he could direct them. He could lead them, going on into that place of where our righteousness to exceed that of that set of rules and re regulations. I was just thinking as you were sharing that, I spent the first 30 years of my life living that way, thinking that I was doing everything. I was going to church. I was, uh, you know, trying to do everything right. I had my, my list of things that I, that I knew I couldn't do. And yet, I didn't realize that it was in my heart to do those things. I wanted to do those things, but I just abstained from doing them, so I thought I was doing okay. And then one, guy, one day, and I've shared this in my testimony before, one day God spoke to me and said, about how much of your heart have you given to me? And that's where I knew that I needed a Savior. And I turned to Jesus and was born again. That's right. 
had that opportunity myself to where, you know, you think <clears throat> you've done all the right things. Always been a good girl, never gave your parents any trouble, but that does not get you into heaven. As a zeal for As God. As a zeal for God, but not one according to knowledge, not one according to the righteousness that God ascribes. And have a heart change. That's right. Having a heart change to where, uh, you know, it's not just a rule, for instance, you don't want to kill somebody because you wouldn't even think of that. That's not in your heart to hurt someone. It's in your heart to help. And, you know, I was thinking about Paul. Uh, Paul was grew up uh, as Saul. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. By his own words, yes. he says he was over in Philippians, the third chapter. I mean, he had done everything according to the law. I mean, he had a lot of credentials. I mean, you talk about uh, education according to the law, everything going for him. But he gave it all up when he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. And he saw what he was like and he knew he was lacking. He gave every one of those credentials up for the sake of Jesus. And he said there, he said, and he wants to be found, actually be found and known as in him, not having any self-achieved righteousness that can be called my own, based on my obedience to the law's demands, ritualistic uprightness, and supposed right standing with God thus acquired, but possessing that genuine righteousness which comes through faith in Christ, the anointed one, the truly right standing with God, which comes from God by saving faith. And that's the key in the kingdom of God. That's right. It is. Not any self-achieved, anything that we have done that we could call our own. All, all of that is nothing compared to our right standing with him and that he does a put to our account. He puts it to our account because we believe and we trust in him. You know, it talks about over there in 1 John, the third chapter, what a quality of love that God has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. What a quality that God has put on us, not man, not the letter of the law, because we do want to make it to heaven. We do want to make it to heaven, and we want our righteousness to be that, that exceeds that, that the letter of the law puts out. So grateful, so thankful for all that God has done in our hearts to change us. And if he hasn't changed your heart, it can happen today. That's right. You turn to him, cry out to him. I mean, we constantly do because there's a daily salvation that needs to come. Every day we need to be saved. We need to be corrected in things that we're thinking were right, they're not right at all. We want to be changed. We want to know that we're right with him constantly every day. Jesus, I want to make it with you. I want to make it with you. And I don't want to just wait to a certain time. No, it's every day walking with him. That's right. Every day walking with him as though it was the last day that we would have to walk with him. So we go over to the other side, going from glory to glory. A little song we sing, he's changing me. He's changing me from one step of glory to the other. And, and going on to that next verse in Philippians 3, <clears throat> excuse me. It says, for my determined purpose is. That's right. My determined purpose is that I may know him, that I may progressively become more deeply and intimately yes. acquainted with with him, perceiving and recognizing and understanding the wonders of his person more strongly and more clearly, and that I may in that same way come to know the power outflowing from his resurrection. Those are the words spoken by someone who came into the knowledge of God about the key of righteous living. That's a key in the kingdom That's of God. That's right. That's that other key. And we love you. We're going to be praying for you and holding on to you. And we're here with you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 8.30 to 9 o'clock. And also on the internet on our website, www.wordoffaithfellowship.org. And you can watch many of the testimonies of people in our church who've had that change of heart. Thank you. God bless you. Have a good day.